Well, what a blessing it is to share the Word of God with you and to come into your homes and to come into your families and come into your hearts with one thing, and that's the Word of God, because this Word is so precious. It, it, it is, it's the one that gives us a new heart. It's the one that gives us a new outlook. It's the one that gives us a new hope amongst our tribulation and hardship that goes around us. And so we bless the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, for He alone is worthy to be praised. He alone is the one that gives us victory. And no matter what happens in life, when God is with you, it don't matter who's against you, or it don't matter who left you. And we're going to be talking about that in a second. So we're going to go to 1 Samuel chapter 10, verses 1 through 27. We're going to do the whole chapter 10 together, and we're going to praise God. That is one name we shall praise. That's it. No, no name shall be praised except God's name. He is worthy alone. He is worthy. That's it. So we go to 1 Samuel chapter 10, uh, and we see that then Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it upon his head. Who's his head? Well, that's Saul's head. Now, what's happening here? So we read, and remember in chapter 9, we read that Samuel, uh, and before that, then that Samuel had gotten old. His sons were kind of like thugs, and uh, peoples like the people of Israel came up to him, the elders of Israel, and said, look, you old terrible, something terrible to say to somebody. You're old and your sons, they're no good. And so we want a king. We want to be like the other nations. Give us a king. This disturbed Samuel like crazy, but he told God and God said, go ahead, give it to him. Just go ahead and give him what they want. And so um, he meets, uh, Samuel meets Saul in chapter nine, right? Wow. <laughs> Saul has lost his asses, his donkeys, his daddy's donkeys, and they're rich people. Uh, and so they, they're going around a 20 mile radius and searching everywhere. They come up to Samuel by no coincidence, by the way, God orchestrated this. And so they, they see Samuel uh, and Samuel uh, takes uh, Saul to dinner with a servant, gives him the best seat in the high place and in, in, in this banquet and also uh, gives him the best part of the meat, the sacrifice. And then he brings him home uh, and, and uh, they get to go up top of the roof, which is flat in uh, these uh, in Judea. And so they they're communing with God. And then the next day, uh, they commune again with God, and then Samuel tells Saul, let your servant go ahead of us, Skazi, bye-bye, go on. And so uh, the, the servant goes forward, and Samuel is going to anoint Saul to be king. And there's, this is where we begin in chapter 10. And then Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it upon his head, Saul's head, and kissed him and said, Is it not because the Lord has anointed you uh, to be the captain over his inheritance? He doesn't call him king at this point. Captain means prince. Uh, and so he's calling him a prince. And, and, and to me, it's fascinating. This is the first time that oil is being poured on somebody's head who's going to be a king. Well, obviously, because he is the first king of Israel. But before this, the practice was that the, the oil would be poured not only on the priest, but also their sacrifices. Like if you go to Exodus chapter 30, verses 30, 31, oil was supposed to be poured on uh, the uh, the priest, the high priest Aaron and his sons. So that was a, a form of cleansing. And in in a, in a minute, we're going to see how the oil is a picture of the Holy Spirit. And so in Leviticus chapter two, verse one to two, when you had the grain offering, there were five major offerings. One of them was the grain offering. And so when they presented that with frankincense, it was flour mixed with frankincense and mixed with oil and they burned it and it was a sweet aroma unto the Lord. But what fascinates me as I was studying this oil is in Zechariah chapter 4 verses 1 through 6 when you know you had uh, Daniel's time was up already right uh, the at 586 BC Babylon with King Nebuchadnezzar took out Israel mainly the southern part of Israel because the northern part was already taken out 700 BC by Assyria. But 586 BC, uh, the Nebuchadnezzar who ruled the world in Babylon, which is modern day Iraq, came and uh, took over uh, the whole world really and uh, took, Is took Judah, Benjamin, took them and exiled them. You had Daniel at that time. And so 70 years passed. Israel ultimately came back. 
uh, to their land. And now we got a dude named Zerubbabel, who's the governor, and Joshua, who is a high priest. They're supposed to rebuild the, the new temple. The, Solomon's temple was destroyed in 586 BC. So they're supposed to rebuild the temple. And all of a sudden, there is a vision that's seen by Zechariah in chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. And you have this candlestick, like a menorah, and it's made out of gold. And there's light coming out of it from like seven places where light comes out. But how is this light coming? Well, there's oil. But where's the oil coming from? And so you see two trees. So beautiful. Two olive trees that are beside this candlestick and oil is flowing out of the olive oil and it's going into the candlestick and it's making the light come out and, and light is shining forth. So, and then it says in 4, 6 of Zechariah uh, to Zerubbabel, it is not by your might, it is not by your power, it ain't by your intellect, it ain't by your degrees, it ain't by nothing you got, but it's by the Spirit, saith the Lord. So the Holy Spirit is like that oil, so to light the candle, to light the fire, to light life, to go forward in life and let go of what's in the past, to go forward and forward and do what God wants you to do and to fulfill His purpose, special purpose for you in your life, to do that. You need the Holy Ghost. You need the Holy Spirit. You need the oil. You need that oil to run all over you. And at that time in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come upon the people. But in the New Testament, you and I will see that the Holy Spirit goes inside us. That's in John chapter 14, verses 16, 17, when the Holy Spirit comes into you and lives in you. If you have the blood of Jesus, when you come to the cross of Calvary and accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, then the Holy Spirit comes into you. Uh, it's so beautiful. And in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit. So it's very different in the Old Testament when it came upon them. And it's very different in our days when the Holy Spirit comes within us. And that is the power for your life. So if you're feeling powerless and if you feel like, I can't go on any longer somebody help me snap yourself out of it and say holy ghost i've been trying to work without you but now i'm gonna work with you and i'm gonna allow you in my spirit to come forth out of me and make me new Woo! oh i'm preaching myself happy and so i hope you're being happy as we we're only on the first verse people hey we go loved ones so they poured the oil on him and um, so that was a sign, if you will, a symbolism that, that he is being anointed. It's in, you can even find it in uh, Psalm 1, 133, where the oil is running on Aaron's head and beard. I mean, they poured it on in, in the old days when you were traveling uh, and, and, you know, we got sandals and all that. And uh, you, when you came into a guest, when you came into the house and you were the guest, they would cleanse your uh, feet with water, but they would also pour oil on your head to to refresh you it's just so beautiful i you know in the in james chapter five anybody got problems anybody sick pour oil on that boy and pray in the name of jesus say it is done it is done by his stripes you were healed hallelujah hallelujah to the lamb of god and so um here we go so he is anointed this is a private matter here right this is not public this is not happening in uh everybody's face here this is samuel one-on-one -on -one with Saul. And so um, when you have departed from me today, then you shall find two men. Okay, so now Samuel is telling Saul what's going to happen. So he has now done the anointing, but now he says, you're going to have a confirmation. You're going to get a confirmation from the Lord that this is what's happening and what's going to happen. That what I just said to you that you're going to be king is for real. So he's going to give him three signs. The first sign is found in two, in verse two. When you are departed from me today, then you shall find two men at Rachel's sepulcher in the border of Benjamin and Zelzah. So that's near Bethlehem, right? Five miles south of Jerusalem. And so that's where Rachel was buried. And uh, that's one of Jacob's wives, one of the, his favorite wife. And in the border of Benjamin and Zelzah, and they will say to you, the asses which you went to seek are found. And lo, your father has left the care of the asses and sorrows for you, saying, what shall I do for my son? And so he's like, look, you're going to meet two men. Not three, not four, not one, two. 
Very specific. When God gives his prophecy, he gives it specifically. And so he tells him, you're going to meet two men and they're going to say, hey child, looky here. Your, um, your daddy has found the asses and now he's not worried about the asses. He's worried about you. That's one. Number two, uh, it's in verse three. And then, then you should go forward from there and you shall come to the plain of Tabor and there shall you meet three men. Now you're going to meet three, three men and they're going to go up to Bethel. Uh, they're, they're on their way to Bethel. I'm, this is so specific. It's insane. And carrying three kids that, that not, that's not children. That's goats. They're, they're carrying three goats and another carrying three loaves and of bread and another carrying a bottle of wine. So he, one man's got three goats. The other man's got three loaves of bread and the other man got a, a you know, a wine bottle. And so uh, is, uh, this is mind boggling. And so it goes on and he goes, they will salute you and give you two loaves of bread, which you shall receive in their hand. I, I, I mean, this, they got three loaves, but they ain't going to give you three. They're going to give you two. So, I mean, uh, what is, uh, it reminds me of, you remember in Genesis chapter 14, verse 18, when Melchizedek meets Abraham, what's he bring him? No, he don't bring him no toys from toy land. He brings him bread and wine. It's, and these people got bread and wine, right? And it, it reminds me of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, where his body, Jesus' body is like the bread. In fact, didn't Jesus say, I am the bread of life? Where was that? In um, John 6, 35. I am the bread of life. Uh, he who comes to me uh, uh, will not hunger and he who believes in me shall never thirst. That's so good. Don't be going hungry. You know when you go hungry? When you and when you and I go hungry? When when you and I go into culture. That's when you and I go hungry. But when we take Jesus to the culture, that's when everybody gets fed. Ooh, thank you Jesus for that. Oh, that's that's Thank you, Holy Spirit. That's good. Okay, so now, uh, where were we, y'all? So Jesus is the bread of life. And in, in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-three, 23, we were there. Um, Jesus' body is his, the bread, the symbolism, that when you and I eat it, we are healed. By his stripes, we are healed, Isaiah 53, 5. And number two, the wine or the drink that he gives to us. When we drink of that as a symbol, that's his blood, and we are cleansed. Oh, see, this, the Old Testament brings out the New Testament. Everything here is pointing to Jesus. I, I'll get there in a second. Y'all going y'all gonna to see in a minute. It's beautiful. Okay, so now, uh, how about the goats, right? I mean, uh, I, and how about the number three anyway? The number three to me in the Bible, when you see it over and over again, it's about perfection. There are several numbers in the Bible that are perfection. Three, seven, ten, and twelve. Each represent different things, but three, like the Trinity, the Father, the, the, the God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. And then you and I were made of the body, the, the soul, and the spirit. So three is a very important number, and it's a complete number, if you will. And then the, how about the three goats? Um, well, the goats were, um, where, where did it say that? It said uh, three men from Bethel. Okay, there it is. A carrying in verse three, three, ain't that something? It's in verse three. Okay, three kids or what, what we say is three goats. And you know, Proverbs 27, 27, it's uh, a goat is actually uh, a symbol for provision. Like you will have goat's milk. So again, one will be carrying three where were we? Three kids, three goats. It's a, it's also a picture of judgment. You remember in Matthew 25, uh, where it says God will separate the sheep from the goats and um, the goats will be saying, but we did this. And and the Lord's like, you didn't do it to the least of these people, to, to the least of my brethren. Uh, you do not get to enter heaven. So that's another thing. And, and also uh, the goat in, in Leviticus, um, and I believe is in Leviticus 16. We can turn there real quick. Leviticus, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus 16, where they had the, you remember the two goats? 
uh, yes, uh, 1621, and Aaron shall lay his hand upon the head of the live goat. So, yeah, there, there were two goats. One was the scapegoat. One was the goat that he'd lay his hand on, and the sin of Israel would come upon the goat, and he would let him go forth in the wilderness. God saying, I'm getting rid of your guilt. Uh, go to a place that is unknown. I'm, I'm throwing your sins away from you. And then the second one was sacrificed, and the innocent blood uh, was shed for uh, the people of Israel. So that that's what, I mean, from provision to judgment to sacrifice, the goats have a different meaning. And I just wanted to say everything and anything that's written in the Bible is not like, okay, three kids, three goats, let's go to the next verse. It's really important to, to dig in and find out what the Bible is trying to teach us. So I'm just, I'm just thrilled that we find the blood and the body of Jesus Christ in verse 3. And they will salute you, he said, and they're going to give you two loaves. I mean, Saul could have been there and gone, uh, how many, how many loaves you got? Three? Uh, and I'm you give me two? And he'd be like, oh, that was the prophecy. Okay, and then in five, and then you shall come to, this is now the third sign uh, Samuel tells Saul that he's going to have as he's going home. And they shall come to the hill of God, verse five, and with a garrison of the Philistines, and it shall come to pass when you are come there into the city that you shall meet a company of prophets coming down from the high place with a psaltery and a, a tablet and pipe and a harp before them, and they shall prophesy. So you're going to have a, a company of prophets a uh, company not as in an LLC or a C Corp or an S Corp, but a company meaning a group of prophets who love God, who sing unto the Lord, who prophesy, and they're going to be coming down from a high place uh, near the, the Philistine uh, territory, Philistine, uh, and that's just a reminder of, hey, Saul, when you become king, you're going to take the Philistines out. And so uh, around that area, and so um, the company is going to come, and they shall prophesy, and it says in verse 6, and the Spirit of the Lord, there it goes, will come upon you, not in you, upon you, and you shall prophesy with them. Saul is clueless. That boy is goodly, and he's tall, but he ain't spiritual, and he don't know God. And But now God has chosen him, not because he's a man after God's own heart, but because the people want an image. They want like Vogue magazine. They want uh, uh, the King's magazine. They want to be on the front cover. And they're finding somebody that's going to be on the front cover. But he's going to prophesy. And he shall be turned into another man. Now, all of a sudden, somebody's going to say, well, his name is Saul. What's he going to be? Uh, Billy Bob uh, or uh, Johnny John? Uh, what's he going to be? Uh, no, he is going to be Saul. Saul is going to be Saul. But his heart's going to change. His mind's going to say, it's just like First, uh, Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, where it says, if anybody's in Christ, now Saul was not in Christ. The Old Testament people weren't in Christ, but they were looking towards Christ. So if anybody's in Christ, he, she is a new creation. The old has passed away. The new has come. In that sense, uh, the spirit of a man uh, or a woman changes. So, uh, and then it says, and let it be when these signs are come, Samuel is still talking to Saul before he goes and sees all these signs, that you do on occasion, uh, do as the occasion serve you. You do what you got to do. Why? Because for God is with you. How do you do it? God is with you. Why do you do it? God is with you. This is so important. I don't care who left you. I don't care who left me. You would be like, <laughs> this year was so bad and they left me and they said this to me and they did this to me and this happened to me. Hold on. Calm down. Chill out. When God is with you, it don't matter who left you. When God is with you, it don't matter who's against you. When God is for you, it don't matter what they said to you. When God is for you, believe me, the enemies are going to bow and they're going to go down. Go do your work. Do the work God has set you to do. And you're like, I don't know what work he's done me to do. Whatever you're good at, believe me, that's the talent he gave you. Do it. Now, if it's stealing and gambling, don't do it. So, now, um, where were we, y'all, uh, before we went to Las Vegas? Here we go. We're coming back. We're coming back to verse 7. God is with you. I, I love that because it reminds me of Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. The virgin shall bear a child, and his name shall be called Emmanuel. God with us. God with you. God with me. 
He's a good God. Joseph, I, I'm just like, uh, you know, God with you. I, when, when I read that, I'm reminded of Joseph. Where is that boy at? He in Genesis. Let me see. Genesis 30-something. 30 37. Uh, okay, yeah. Genesis 37, verse 24. And they took him. Uh, this is Joseph and his brothers. Those ten brothers of his, Benjamin was at home, the ten brothers that hated him, and they took him and cast him into the pit, and the pit was empty. There was no water in it. The pit may have been empty, but let me tell you something. God was with him. And in verse 30, uh, chapter 39, we'll go to 39, and we'll check out verse 3. Uh, Genesis 39, 3. And this master, he was taken, uh, and he was sold to uh, Pharaoh Potiphar, uh, and, and his master saw that the Lord was, what? Was with him okay so potiphar's wife does something dumb dumb and so she's like uh she says she tried to rape me he didn't she tried to rape him on and on and um he's sent to prison joseph is sent to prison but what happens in prison chapter 39 verse 21 but the lord was with joseph and showed him mercy i i I don't know. I love that. It's just so beautiful to me. And then we'll go to Genesis 41 when Joseph ultimately got to the king's palace and Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand. That's Genesis 41, 42. And put it upon Joseph's hand. And he put some bling bling. It doesn't say bling bling, but that's what it means on him. And so what? why? Because God was with him. I'm telling you, when God is for you, you don't have to be sitting here and be tripping about finances and all the things that are happening in this world because God's economy for you is very different than the economy of the world. And if you want your economy to increase, may I say, if you want your economy to increase, then sow seeds into God's kingdom. And, and people are like, well, I don't know where to go. Go to the place, give to the place who is helping you, who is bringing joy and hope, the word of God into your life and that word is changing your life that's where you give your uh, resources to but so into ministries around the world that you may bless those people as they are blessing you and let them go and bless other people hallelujah hallelujah okay so god with you i'm telling you stop just stop talking about who left you who said what to you who did what to you just say in the past god is with me and that's all that matters to me. And so when they go down before me, uh, uh, Samuel saying, and then you should go down. This hasn't yet happened, right? He's telling Saul, Saul what's, uh, what's going to happen to him. He's going to meet, he's going to get those three signs. And then he says in verse eight, and you shall go down before me uh, to Gilgal and behold, I will come down to you to offer burnt offerings and to sacrifice sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days shall you tarry or wait till I come to you and show you what you shall do. Kings don't wait for nobody. You and I, shall be waiting for the king but he is telling samuel is teaching saul something very important you may be king and you may be goodly and you may be tall but you're gonna wait for me because i got the word of god we are gonna wait on the word of god those who wait on the lord shall renew their strength right they, they'll mount up on the wings of eagles isaiah 40 31 so wait 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 for the lord and wait for his word it's so important even the king has to wait for uh, God's word. And in verse 9, and it's so that when he has turned his back, when, when Saul turned his back to go from Samuel, so he's, he's got to turn his back and go out of the city, and now he's going to meet those three signs, right? Uh, that God gave him another heart. And all those signs came to pass that day. So on that specific day, everything that was said came to pass. And so it says God, in verse 9, gave him another heart, meaning a new heart. In Ezekiel 36, 26, God will give you a new heart. He will give you a new spirit. Take away, nobody can take away that broken heart of yours, not even a cardiologist. I, I, I can't take away a broken heart. I can give medications. I can pray over my patients. But only God can give you a new heart and a new spirit. God alone can do that and God is ready so the broken heart of this year as we enter into a new let your broken heart just give it to him and say I'm here I'm here father I'm here to get a new heart I'm here to get a new spirit I'm here to be another man. I'm here to be, if you're a lady, I'm here to be another woman. I'm here, Father. I'm here. I'm your servant. I'm here. I, I, I give you my brokenness. I give you my darkness. I give you my confusion. I give you my tears. I give you my heartache. I give you my backache. I give you my headache. I give you all my aches. And I accept your goodness 
and I accept your new heart that you give me, and I accept that you're going to take the heart of stone and unforgiveness and anger and misery and complaining. And you're going to give me a heart of flesh, a new heart. Oh, thank you, Lord. Ah, oh, he's good. He's a good God. Just a good God. Amen. So, uh, and so he got, he's going to get a new heart, and he did, and all that came to pass on that day. And in verse 10, and, and when they came there to the hill, behold, a company of prophets met with him, and the Spirit of God came upon him and prophesied among them. And uh, so the Spirit of God did fall on him. And it came to pass when all that knew him before time saw that, behold, he prophesied. Saul was prophesying about the prophets. Then the people said to one another, what is this that's come to the son of Kish? They know him. That boy is not a prophet. He was chasing donkeys. He might be goodly, but he ain't a prophet. Is Saul among the prophets? And then uh, in verse 12, it says, and, and one of the same place answered and said, but who is their father? Like, who's the father of these prophets? We don't know. Therefore, it, it, it became a prophet. But we do know who, uh, in a sense, we don't we don't know who those people's fathers are. We don't know, you know, where they came from. But Saul's kid, I mean, Kish's kid, um, Kish's son, Saul, we know where he's from and he's not a prophet. And, and therefore, it came as a proverb. They, people said that as a proverb. Is Saul among the prophets? That's like me saying, well, Dr. Kojiglanian, is now a neurologist. And you're like, no, he's a cardiologist, by God's grace only, by the way. He's a cardiologist. And so you, you would say, well, how is he a, a neurologist? So in a sense, by saying, is Saul also among the prophets, would mean, is Dr. Kojiglanian also a neurologist? That's what it means. It just doesn't make sense. It is what they're saying. And when he had made an end to the prophesying, he came to the high place. And Saul's uncle said to him, all of a sudden his uncle appears. He's not Uncle Sam, but he's just uncle. I don't know what his name is, but it's his Saul's uncle. And to him, and said to his servants, where went you? Uh, like, where did you go? And to uh, and and he said, Saul said to seek the asses. And when we saw that they were nowhere, we came to Samuel. So Saul is telling the uncle I was about to say Uncle Sam. It's not Uncle Sam. When he's talking to his uncle and he says, we, we came to Samuel. And Saul's uncle said, well, tell me, I pray you, what Samuel said to you? And Saul said to his uncle, he told us plainly that the asses were found. That's all he says. That's the truth, right? He didn't tell him everything. But of the matter of the kingdom whereof Samuel spoke, he told him not. So that's when we know what uh, uh, Samuel was telling Saul. He was talking to him about the kingdom of God. And but the uh, what's his name? Saul. Saul uh, kept his mouth shut. He didn't say everything, which is good. I think we all should learn not to be like Joseph, where Joseph was like, ah, I got this robe. It's so pretty. And I dreamed that you, my brothers, you're going to bow before me. Isn't that good? It's not oh, lovely. No, that's not lovely. You do not share all your dreams and your purposes that God has given you with anybody and everybody. You know, uh, that's what uh, that's what Saul is doing here. What did he say? Um, he said, but, the, for, uh, but of the matter of the kingdom whereof Samuel spoke, what Samuel had told him before he left, uh, he told him not. He didn't say anything about it. I mean, it's in Proverbs. 17 26 even a fool is thought to be wise when he shuts his mouth i'm saying sometimes you and i need to shut our mouths don't be sharing everything god told you with anybody and everybody god came to me in a dream and he told me such and such don't be telling everybody say lord i am your servant Make your ways known to me by knowing that you are with me and for me. I know I can do what you call me. And the Holy Spirit in me, I know I can do what you call me to do. Okay, let the Lord reveal to others. You don't have to speak. I don't have to speak. The Lord shall do. Okay, so, and then Samuel called the people to together to the uh, Lord and Mizpah. So now, all of a sudden, we have... Um, what was private now is going to become public. I just dropped my pen. Excuse me for one second, y'all. I'm going to go get my pen and then I'm going to show you a map. Here we go.
I'm back. <laughs> All right, so here's a, a little uh, picture picture of Israel. Hold still, map. Okay, so this is the Mediterranean Sea, right? And this is the uh, the Dead Sea, and this is the Jordan River, and above where it's not in this picture, you get uh, the uh, Sea of Galilee, right? And so here is uh, Jerusalem, and here is Bethlehem. That's where Rachel's tomb is, by the way. Uh, we uh, that's the, uh, the uh, when where was this in verse? Um, it was in verse 2. Uh, you're going to find two men at Rachel's sepulcher. Okay, so uh, that's near Bethlehem. And this is the circuit which, uh, this is Ramah where uh, Samuel lived. And this is Shiloh where Samuel uh, was a little prophet. Remember when he was a baby, his mama took him to Shiloh. And so that's near Israel. It's kind of like in the middle of his, uh, I mean, that's near the, the Dead Sea. And so Samuel went on, on tour from Gilgal to Bethel to Mizpah all the time. And here in Mizpah is where he's calling everybody, okay? He's calling everybody here to come to Mizpah. And by the way, Mizpah is where in chapter 7, in chapter 7, uh, Samuel gathered the people and uh, he made them get rid of the Ashtaroth and the Baal and, and just tear them down. And, and he prayed for them and then they and they beat the Philistines. Remember when God thundered and the Philistines like, ah, ah, they ran? Oh, may your enemies run. May they come at you one way, but run seven ways. Ooh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I rebuke the enemy in the name of Jesus Christ, who is so wants to devour you and me. No, I rebuke him in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Okay, where were we? So he comes to Mizpah. And he gathers everybody and, and then, and he said to the children of Israel, thus says the Lord of Israel, I brought you out of Israel, out of, uh, I brought you up Israel out of Egypt and delivered you out of the hand of Egyptians and out of the hand of the kingdoms and, and them that oppressed you. I mean, who, who is their king? Jesus, God, the father is their king. He, he, God brought them out. And now they want, I want a king. I don't want a king I can't see. I want a king I can see. Well, okay, that's what you're going to get then. All right. So, and so he's, Samuel's reminding him, uh, hello, I know you want a king, but the king of kings is your king, and he's the one that got you out of Egypt, remember? Okay, so, and you shall, and you have this day rejected your God. Ooh, that's, may it never be that you and I come to a point where we reject God or his word. And may you and I be servants that obey him 24 7 blessed be his name and so they reject and they rejected him who himself saved you he himself not a king saved you out of all the uh uh, uh, uh let's see where am I? <laughs> who saved Who saved you out of all your adversities and your uh, tribulations and you have said to him nay but set a king over us uh, they're talking to God nay oh, go on God I know you're God, but we want to see somebody that looks like a king. By the way, um, when they poured oil on the kings, the people around them also poured oil, but not olive oil. They poured oil of a bull, let's say, and they burned that oil um, and, and they poured it on it because they wanted their king to be bullish. I'm not kidding. This is for real. See the difference between the nations that are heathens and a nation that is of God. And you are a nation. You're a holy nation. According to 1 Peter 2, 9. You. Yes, yes. Don't look around. You. I'm talking to you. You are a holy nation. When you are in underneath the blood of the Lamb, you are a new creation. You are a holy nation. You are a royal priesthood. You are consecrated by God and called by God and called special by God. You, you are to proclaim the praises of the Lord who has brought you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. You, amen. Yes, you. Hallelujah. He loves you. That's why he calls you a holy nation. And so uh, they're like, nay, but set a king over us. Now, therefore, present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and, and your thousands. So Samuel wants them to get all their tribes, 12 tribes. <laughs> Line them up, boys and girls, and uh, we're going to pick somebody. And then Samuel had caused all the tribes of Israel to come near the tribe of Benjamin was taken. This is just like you remember in Joshua chapter 7, where this dude named Achan was um, in the land of Ai, um, and, and uh, he stole um, gold and silver and whatever, he, uh, jewels, money, money, and he wasn't supposed to take anything 
when they were fighting and Achan took it and then, uh, then Israel went to war and battles and they were losing and they're like, why are we losing? And God's like, uh, you got a problem child in your camp. And they, they brought all the tribes and they picked the tribe by, you know, one tribe by casting lots. That's how they pick people, casting lots. And uh, so they they picked uh, his Achan tribe and then ultimately got to his uh, clan and ultimately came to Achan. And Achan uh, was the one who had stolen and him and his wife and his whole family got stoned to death. And, and God wanted the... the the nasty coming out, getting out of uh, the tribes of Israel. And and so this is kind of like the, this is similar. And I, I don't know, maybe the people are freaking out going, oh, what's going to happen? What is he doing with all these tribes? And they, they picked the tribe of Benjamin, which is the smallest tribe. And then he calls um, in 21, when he had caused the tribe of Benjamin to come near by their families, the family of Matri was taken, so the clan of uh, Matri was taken, and then Saul, the son of Kish, so then they picked Kish, and then they picked Saul, was taken, and they sought him, but they couldn't find him. Where's the boy at? Where's the goodly boy? Okay, so the goodly boy, we find out in 22, uh, therefore they inquired of the Lord, Lord God, where is he? Probably Samuel asked the Lord, uh, and um, if the man should come there, and the Lord answered, no, therefore they inquired of the Lord, Further, if the man should come f there, if the man yet, huh? If the man should yet come there, and the Lord answered, "Behold, he has hidden himself among the stuff." This is your king, hiding. So the king has hid himself among the stuff. What is stuff? Uh, stuff is like baggage or equipment, and he's hiding underneath all his baggage. He doesn't want to be seen. Is this humility on his part? Is this stupidity on his part? Is this fear on his part? I'm not sure. I think part of it is fear, but yet we have to understand he had a new heart, right? And what does he do with that heart? Oh, we're going to find out. In chapter 11, what he does with a new heart. See, just because God gives you and me a new heart doesn't mean you're all fixed. Just because you and I are new creation doesn't mean you're all fixed. The spirit may be all fixed, but the body and the soul got to follow God. You and I have a choice to make daily, daily, minute to minute. Honor him or honor ourselves. Go after the flesh. Go after what we see. Go after the, uh, you know, the pride of life or go after God. You and I have to make a choice. No matter what our hearts are, the new heart that is given, you still have to make a choice. The boy going to make a lot of choices. And we're going to find out in chapter 11 what kind of choices he makes, this king. But right now he has chosen to hide himself amongst the baggage. And I can imagine them taking the baggage off. And, and then, the, and then he, he's, he's all like this. And then he comes up and they're like, oh, oh, wow. He's seven foot tall. You know, he's like, wow, goodly and all that. And they're like, oh. He, ooh, and they bring him back to Samuel and uh, in verse 23, and they ran and brought him there. And when he stood among the people, he was higher than any other people from his shoulders and upward. So yes, he's tall. We know that. And so people were like, oh, oh, he's so, oh, GQ and Vogue magazine. Oh, my, 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 my. Uh, people tripping out about Hollywood people. And I'm like, you don't need to be tripping out about Hollywood people because they already tripped out themselves. You see what I'm saying? And Samuel said to all the people, See ye him whom the Lord has chosen, that there is none like him among all the people. I don't know. I'm not sure if Samuel's like, Look, he's the best. I don't think so. I think Samuel's like, Hmm, you know, this is what you wanted, people. Here is the best of the best. You should have followed God. He's your real king, but you wanted an image, and here's your image. In Isaiah chapter 45, verse 6, it says, uh, from the rising of the sun to the place where it sits, God is talking about himself. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sits, there is none besides me. I am he, and there is no other. Wow. And there's none like him in a sense. And here is like Samuel's like, oh yes, there's none amongst the people like him. 
And all the people shouted and said, God save the king! Or, in a sense, long live the king! Long live the king! Well, they can't say that about, you know, they were waiting for the day, waiting for the day, where they could say that, well, the uh, Amalekites and the, the Philistines say, long live the king, and uh, we can't say, long live God! He lives forever! So we want a king so we can say, long live the king! Okay, you got your chance. Here you go. Go ahead and shout. And they're like, oh, long live the king! Long live the king! <laughs> you got what you got. But you're not going to be sorry for what you asked for. Mm -hmm. Be careful what you ask of God. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who enjoy it will enjoy, or the, those who love it will enjoy of its fruit. Uh, and that's in Proverbs 18, 21. And so, um, be careful what you and I ask for from God, right? They're like, long live the king, long live the king. So they got a chance to be like the Amalekites. There you go. Uh, they got the chance to be like the Canaanites. They got the chance to be like the, the Philistines. They got it. They finally got it. And just because they got it, and just because they, got, they stomped their feet and threw a tantrum, doesn't mean that God's ultimate goal of him being the king of kings and the lord of lords like we see in Daniel chapter 2 where a rock comes and just shatters all these earthly gold silver and and uh, the bronze and and the iron and the clay all of that who's that rock that shatters the rock is Jesus the ultimate purpose of God will not be shaken despite you and me making big mistakes it will not be shaken. He's a great God. And he's a merciful God. I mean, it's a merciful God like stopping in his tracks to look at Bartimaeus to say, what can I do for you? And Bartimaeus is like, I want to see. I want to see. And, and Jesus said, your faith has made you whole. And he opened up his eyes. And the first person he sees is his creator and his redeemer. If you want to see, if you want a new heart, new eyes for the new beginning, go to God. Ask for his purpose and know that God is with you. And then in verse uh, the 25, we're coming to a close here. Then Samuel told the people of, uh, the, manor, uh, of the manor of the kingdom and wrote it in a book and laid it before uh, the Lord. And so Samuel's like saying, look, you, you got what you want. I'm going I'm to bring you back to God's word. And I believe he probably took him to Deuteronomy 17, 17, where it's like, hey, if you're going to be the king, you can't, you, number one, have to be from your tribes. It can't be an outside person. It's got to be from Israel, number one. Number two, you can't have many wives. Number three, you can't have many horses. So he told the, the king what he can do, what he cannot do. But ultimately, the kings like Solomon did what they wanted to do. They got their own and they were not serving the people, but the people were serving them and shame on all the leaders of the world that now today they want money 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 and they want power 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 and they don't want to serve the people but they want to be served it's rotten the only real ruler is jesus christ he will rule with equity and righteousness no man can do that okay so now but let the leaders be man and women of god to lead us to help us. Amen. Pray for the leaders to be men and women of God who know him, not who deny him, not who don't want him, not who say, who's God? We don't want God. Uh, that offends people. Baby, God made you and God put the breath in you. What you talking about offense? Talk about life. He put the life in you. Oh, my, my. And Saul went home. Um, so, and Samuel sent all the people home. Go, go on, get it. Go on, get you. Get you home. Go on with your bad selves. And every man to his house. And Saul also went home to Gibba. And you know what Gibba means? It's a, it means a hill. And so that's where Saul went. That's his home. A hill. Keep that in mind for a second. And then went with him a hand of man whose hearts God had touched. Isn't that lovely? God touched people to say, you need to help. You need to help uh, Saul. And God will send you people who will help you.
who will help you physically, who will help you spiritually, who will help you mentally, psychologically. God will send people, but this is the best help right here, the Bible. Ooh, there's no other, there's no other greater help. There's no other greater, uh, I mean, you can go to a psychologist and say, when I was a kid and blah, 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 blah. I ain't making fun. I'm just saying blah, 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 blah. And, and so, but you can talk all you want to right here. That's your healing. Okay, so now, and the, and the children of Belial said that these are worthless people. Remember, Eli's sons were called children of Belial, Hophnes, and Phinehas. Worthless, foolish people. How shall this man save us? Can he save us? And like Saul, what does he think he is? They had no problems with him when he was chasing donkeys. But now they got a problem that he a king. And they despised him and brought him... No presence, but he held his peace. That's really good. Hold your peace. Hold your peace. In Exodus 14, 14, when the people of Israel were tripping out and God was going to get them across the Red Sea, God told them, hold your peace. Be still. I will save you. Hold your peace. So no matter what you're going through, just hold your peace. Oh, sometimes you got to speak and tell the fool that he's a fool. Sometimes you and I got to shut up because the fool is really a fool and ain't nothing going to stop the fool. See what I'm saying? Okay, so now, uh, so hold your he held Saul, bravo for him. He held his peace. He didn't go, you men of Belial, you should bow down. There. No, he just, God will take care of it. God will take care of it. Isn't this fascinating that he had oil on him? So in Matthew chapter 3, we see that the Holy Spirit whew, descends upon Jesus Christ. When John the Baptist is... Um, when John the Baptist is, is anointing him or when he is uh, baptizing him. And so that's one thing. Uh, and, and Saul is supposed to be a great king, right? Well, there is a king of kings, Jesus Christ. You find that in Revelation chapter 19, verse 11 and onward, that Jesus Christ is the king of kings. The Holy Spirit fell upon him. I mean, he is God. He is uh, the Holy Spirit, if you will. That This is God in one. But the Holy Spirit came upon him, and he did go up to a hill. See, Saul here went up to Gibba, which is a hill. But Jesus went to another hill, and that's Calvary's hill. And, and there were people who were with him, but there were people who were belied that were against him, even to this day. So on the tree of Calvary, he died for you and me and shed that blood. And he died, and then he rose from the dead. And there are people who said, "Get if you're the son of God, get yourself off that cross. Who do you think you are? Blasphemy, on and on. Until the day, people like that, what kind of Bible is this? Men wrote this Bible, and, and this Bible is not good. It's ancient, blah, blah, blah. And they say all kinds of nasty stuff. What kind of Jesus is this? You narrow-minded people, when you say God is, Jesus said, I'm the way the truth and the life no one comes to the father except through me how dare you on and on and on and on they go belial and i say that in love because uh, a fool says in his heart the bible says that there is no god in psalm 14 3 and in uh, psalm 53 3 so a fool says in his heart there is no god right there is no one good so in it's just in psalm 14 1 through 3 psalm 53 1 through 3 that's what a fool says so i'm not saying it in a mean way or ugly way or a hateful way i'm just saying if you're in that company come come to the company come to the hill of calvary where you can experience the love of jesus christ where he loves you honors you wants you and he will do great things for you remember everybody left as long as you got God, God was with him. As long as chapter 10, verse 7, God was with him. As long as you got God, it don't matter what's happening outside. Because he will build you to go out and do his work and the purpose that he has given to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, may the Lord bless you and keep you. Shine his face upon you. Be gracious to you. Don't you look around. Look to God. He is with you. He is your Emmanuel, and he has called you to be a royal priesthood. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen.